Hi, my name is Campton Carter and I'm with ECTV. Today we're here with Lily, who will be interviewing Dr. Roberto Vargas about his work as an activist. Hi, I'm Lily with ECTV, and today I am here with Dr. Roberto Vargas. Um, we're just here to talk a little bit about the activism that he's done in the community. So thank you for being here. Well, here, thank you. And uh, I definitely look forward to getting to know each other more as, we, um, as I get the opportunity to do some sharing with you. Yeah, so um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, here, um, we can go by Roberto. I was actually born here in Ventura County in 1950 in Santa Paula. So I, I grew up in, in Santa Paula as the oldest son of an immigrant family, essentially Mexican-American folks. Um, my mom came from Mexico, so she was an immigrant. She didn't speak um, Spanish, she didn't speak English. And I was the oldest son, and so a lot of ways, me and my mom created a really great partnership when I was young because my, my dad had to travel for the work. and. Um, so that meant my mom and I had to figure out how to navigate, how to take care of family, because I had three younger brothers, and um, so we became really good partners. And so from Santa Paula, went up moving to Long Beach at one point, and um, did a lot of growing up there. Subsequently went to Long Beach State College, and over the years wound up going up to Berkeley, and now I'm back here in Ventura County, and uh, I totally love being here because um, Ventura County is a very special place. A lot of special people come out of Ventura County, and a lot of them are committed to creating a, a better world. So I'm glad to be part of that. Yeah. Um, so what do you do as an activist? Well, um, my early work, I was a, a therapist. I um, actually started one of the first Latino counseling centers in the country up in Oakland, and I was very much involved in helping people discover more their personal power and also create healing for themselves. And also in community organizing, because the reality is that a lot of the issues my community faces requires you know, different kinds of changes, from changes in school policies to county policies or whatever. So, so I was able to wed my learning from, from therapy work, my learning from community organizing, and um, I wound up developing a practice which is um, of an of an organizational psychologist. So as an organizational psychologist, I help what I call proactive organizations be their best. Proactive organizations are organizations are about social justice, um, environmental protection. So my job is to help them be totally effective in all that they do. And so that's how I do a lot of my activism now. That's really great. Um, so what inspired you to start doing this kind of work? Well, I, I believe I, I was raised in, in a family tradition which was about let's, let's support each other to be our best. So in my family, I feel there was a, a lot of love that was there. I grew up in a Latino Methodist church. And actually, I liked the teachings about Jesus Christ. Here, here this guy was about creating good in the world. There's a lot I didn't like about the church teachings, but in terms of his teachings, I appreciate it. So... In terms of what I learned as a young person um, about myself, my spirit, um, in terms of what I saw in my family, it was about all of us doing our part to, to make the world better. And so it became, as, to me, it was just a very, well, it's been very much my life purpose, is, is let's, let's do my part to make the world better. So you mentioned family, and I know that you wrote a book on family activism. So what inspired you to start authoring books? Okay, well, um, let me just back up a little bit. Um, what really got me turned on to, to counseling was during the time I was at Long Beach State College. I was working about three jobs, just trying to earn enough money to go through college, and I got this job as the evening receptionist at the counseling center. So here I am in the evening receptionist, and I see often a number of these students come in looking really depressed and down, and then I see them leave kind of more, more hopeful. And then I thought, gosh, you know what? I'd like to see therapy services for my community, for my Mexican-American, Latino community, because virtually no counseling services existed for, for my folks. And so that's when the idea became, well, you know what? 
I want to be a Chicano therapist, but ideally I'd like to tr try to organize Chicano Latino counseling centers so we could have centers that could be bilingual, that could use a lot of our cultural knowledge, cultural understanding. So that's where my vision became to organize Latino counseling center. And, and a lot of that had to do with creating greater family health and well-being. And over the years realized that centers can do so much However, families can do a lot for each other, for themselves. So, so I drew on my organizing knowledge and experience, my, my learning around therapy, and began to look at how can families really help them each other to, to heal, to become more united, to become more mutually supportive. So I want developing this idea of family activism. Family activism is families or people actively trying to kind of create greater well-being for their family, which could be their blood relations, you know, their parents, their siblings, their uncles, aunts, or it can be their created families. Because oftentimes we create families, good friends become our families. And um, you're lit young for this, but later on you'll be going to college, you'll have roommates, and you're living together. So you're like a family, and ideally as a family you should kind of meet periodically to say, okay, well, hey, are we being fair with all the chores? You know, how can we be better supportive of each other? How we, can we really help each other be our best? So for me, family activism is about kind of working with either your, your own family or your created family in terms of how do we help each other just be in positivity. Because the more positive we are about ourselves, we create greater sex, success and well-being for ourselves, but also for people around us. So on the topic of the book, um, are there any specific passages from it that you would like to share? Uh, well, I very much encourage um, families to take time to do what in our culture we call conocimiento. Conocimiento is actually talking to get to know each other. Like a little bit earlier, we were sharing in such a way where I was getting to know you better, you and you me better, you I better. And that we are doing conocimiento, the more we do conocimiento, it allows trust to develop. Mutual awareness, trust. The more trust, then there's more potential we have to make good things happen. So I very much encourage families to take time to do conocimiento. Because just because you're family, you don't know what each other's hopes are, visions, challenges. So I encourage families to kind of take time to, you know, maybe get around the kitchen table or, or sit around the living room and, and do a talking circle. And here's an a example of a talking stone. And um, so the book speaks to how can we use a talking stone to take the time to share with each other, to know more about each other, and then explore how we can support each other. So typically everyone would take a turn to share maybe, you know, these are the good things happening in my life and these are the challenges. And by hearing each other in this way, you go, oh my gosh, you know what, I can help you with that. Or you know what, I really need some help. So it really creates the opportunity for us to, to get more honest and truthful and explore how we can support each other. So pretty much the book is, is different examples about how to do that using different, different tools. Does your book draw on any events that happened in your life? Okay, well, the book came out of very important events in my life. Um, one of them was um, here I was, a young man, director of this mental health center. It's one of the first in the country serving Latino folks. And I'm getting calls from throughout the Southwest, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, folks asking, gosh, can you come out our way and, and help us figure out how to develop a similar counseling center here? So to the degree possible, I was trying to do that. I was taking care of business in Oakland, going to visit different programs, and I got, I got burnt out. I really got burnt out and thought, you know what? I need to take a break. I need to restore my own health and well-being. So I'll do that by going home to my family because that's where it nurtures my well-being. So I um, went back home, and at that point it was, uh, it, was, um, it was in Cyprus near Long Beach, and I was so saddened to see that my family was in bad shape. And um, here I was traveling around the country helping families to, to, to heal. And then 
what was going on within my family was one of my brothers had came out gay and he came out and the consequence was was some difficulty with the family to accept who he was. I mean, my, my parents were just like, gosh, you know, he's sick. You know, what can we do about it? And another brother was upset. How can you do it, do this to us? And, and I thought, gosh, if I'm concerned about families, I've got to start with my own. So I thought it's time to use just all my skills, my organizing skills, my therapy skills, and see what I can do for my family. One thing led to another, and um, I brought the family, invited all the family over to, to my home for Thanksgiving. I thought, okay, neutral ground, bring family together. So I started with one-to-one -one conversations with each. Everyone was going to make it. When the event happened, it turned out that the two brothers that weren't talking to each other just didn't show up. Um, but my, my parents were there, and, and we started this process of, of dialogue because at, at one point I said, look, you know what? Family has always kind of been healing for me, but right now things are going on where we're not really being for each other in that way. And so um, it led to, to actually a whole opening up of this issue um, of Jack being gay. And, yeah, sure enough, my dad said, hey, look, we can't do, you know, we, all we can do is pray for your brother. He's sick, you know. And then my mother started crying, like, you know what, it's my fault. It's my fault. And, you know, Mom, it doesn't work that way. She goes, no, I prayed for a girl and see what happened. So anyways, um, it allowed the wound to open up and allowed conversations to happen, which ultimately just aided us as a family to heal. The reality is it took a couple years because here that was the initial opening up. But out of that experience, we all commit ourselves to continue the process. And, you know, we reach out to, to, to my brothers. And so it, it took a little while, but, but within two or three years, we were able to have a family gathering that included everybody, my brother and my brother's partner. So I was able to see how, as family members, we can create healing for each other. And a lot of it has to do with with actually kind of courageously creating opportunities to, to do honest dialogue with each other. So that's where I started in the classes I taught, because back then I taught at the University of California, Berkeley, um, a community organizing class. I'd have students, as one of their assignments, to have a family meeting, family gathering, just to meet each other. And initially they're like, no, 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 we're here to organize community, not deal with family. I said, look, if you want a better world, it begins with your family. So in a lot of ways, that was the impetus to, to write the book, was just discovering there's ways which, by which families can talk to each other, develop trust with each other, and miracles can happen. Because in a lot of ways, I think it was a tremendous miracle in terms of how far my, my dad and mom were able to grow in the process, um, and how much we were able to grow, too, also, as, as, as the children, as the sons, to be able to, to truly accept each other and support each other. So, so that's something that inspired your book. And within, within your book, you mention a few approaches. Um, could you explain to us what the familia approach is? Well, the familia approach in a lot of ways is, is almost acknowledging, recognizing that fundamentally we have just so much love for our families. And, and it's to, to use that to courageously create the opportunities where we could talk to each other. Um, I had crazily talked to my dad, you know, and, and which wasn't easy because in a lot of ways his philosophy was he has the first word, the last word, and, and most of the words in between. <laughs> so it involved a process. But it, it's the family approach is recognizing that family is family for now and for the rest of our lives. So it's worth investment to, to create the opportunities to know each other deeply. And and if we if we don't connect this time, we'll be in courageously optimistic that next time we'll get deeper. And so it's, it's, it's trying our best, but sometimes families aren't ready to, to heal or talk. So, okay, in that case, then recognize, okay, I still have this, this love here, so let me interact with my good friends that, that are family. Let me help them be their best. Let's create relationships where we support each other. So the whole family approach is, is recognizing that, that inherent love we have and using it, tapping on it to to help us create well-being within our own families, particularly through, through active communications, which is, um, is about learning how to ask good questions, but then also listening. 
really listening. You also mentioned the, uh, I'm so sorry if I butcher this, uh, the Rasalogia approach. Okay, the Rasalogia approach. Um, well, Rasalogia literally means knowledge of and for the people. So back then, 1970s, I'm starting this Latino counseling center. And in a lot of ways, we recognized we had to almost reinvent therapy because almost all therapy models were, were built upon dominant culture, Anglo-Saxon experiences. They, they weren't related, they didn't totally connect to our Latino experience, our indigenous experience, our working class experience. So Rasalogia was the idea that we can dialogue with each other to develop approaches, wisdom, to help create more healing through therapy. So we use Rasalogia as a means of learning from our experience to develop better therapeutic therapeutic approaches. And by doing that, we started doing therapy where we'd go and do home visitations, because that way you, you involve the full family in the healing. Um, we'd do an extended therapeutic hour, not just 55 minutes, because when you're doing, working with the whole family, it takes longer. We'd use different cultural approaches, which could be doing a little bit of a ceremony, or, or just acknowledging um, que cultura cura. That's kind of one of the philosophies we have is there is healing in knowing more of our culture. And so kind of using the, those, those orientations, understandings. So Rasa Lujia was about, again, knowledge being created of the people, for the people, um, to in this case, create greater health and well-being and healing. Yeah. And therapy is a very, can be a very subjective thing, you know, can look a little bit different for everybody and it's important to take a look at what a person's individual needs are. So that's really, really great. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, you also mentioned the Por Vida teachings. Um, can you explain those? Yeah, the Por Vida, mm -hmm. yes. Well, what's beautiful is that we are each inherently Por Vida. Our spirit is Por Vida. Por Vida means for life, love, and evolutionary change. So our spirit nature is energy of, of love, energy of life. And we're not really taught that. In fact, unfortunately, in this society, we get bombarded with a lot of communications saying, oftentimes, you're not, you're not smart enough, you're not good looking enough, you're not tall enough, you're just not enough. So we take in a lot of those messages and it develops what we call el no, a mindfulness that, you know, again, no, you're not good or smart enough and all of that. So Por Vida is, again, acknowledging that our essence is, is, is such that each of us is brilliant, caring, loving. And to the degree we connect with that energy we have, it enables us to be actually more of all of that, more, more loving and caring. So I feel a lot of my work is to help people connect more with their, you know, their spirit or their Por Vida consciousness or their love energy. But we all have that. And to the degree we tap onto that, you know, you could become a greater songwriter, singer. Um, people here could become all of what they would love to be because they'd own more of their personal power, their self-confidence, their ability to to be the great person they're, they're here to be. So all of this methodology that you talk about in your writing, how did you develop it? Well, again, through the experience of, of, of the doing, um, you, you learn a lot of ways um, to be courageously positive. Because again, oftentimes this society, we're not taught to be positive. We're kind of taught to be a little bit cynical. Hey, it can't be done. You know, we can't do it. But it's to be positive in terms of, yes, we can create a better community. We can create a better school environment. We can create a better classroom. We can create a better family. So it's a being positive with a vision that better is possible, better is doable. And it all begins by recognizing the inherent goodness in each other person. And so by, by beginning to see the goodness in others, you discover their strengths and abilities, or you help them discover it. By saying, hey, you know what, I know we just met, but I totally appreciate the way you can be totally attentive to someone. 
because it makes someone else feel special. So maybe you never heard that before, and that's a talent you, that I just experienced that you have. <laughs> and so by sharing that, you begin to own that more, which makes you more powerful, more capable, more able to do good things. So it's that developing that, that positive orientation or that board vida orientation. And I think in the world today, given all of what's going on, you know, internationally, you know, throughout the world, in this country, we need more positivity. We need more courageous optimism and hope. We need to recognize that, you know, we're the leaders that our community's been waiting for. Whether you're a high schooler, a, a mom, a dad, um, a professional person, you, we all have leadership potentials and talents, and we need to step into that because the world needs a lot more positivity. So with that in mind, with everything that's going on in the world right now, what are some ideas that people can begin to implement in their own lives? Well, in a lot of ways, it's connect with your, your own purpose, because we're all here on Mother Earth with a purpose. We share a human purpose, which is to evolve our ability to be more human, more, more spiritful, more our board vida essence. So we're all here to learn how to become our best. So at one level is to kind of connect with that idea in terms of to become my best, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Because maybe you're here to, to help fulfill some of the visions that your, your folks had. Or maybe you're here because your passion is music, to kind of create music. Or, or maybe your passion is to help young people be their best. So connect more with your purpose and acknowledge, okay, that's why I'm here. Now, how do I make that happen? So it's connect with purpose, connect with your vision, your, your goals, and then trust that you can make it happen. Um, it's going to be a path which, you know, sometimes there's, there's you know, great victories and sometimes there's struggle, but that's your purpose. You're here to, to, to grow from that experience. So you commit to fulfilling your, your own goals. Because I feel when people look at their own, their own goal, their own purpose, on a whole, they discover a lot of it has to do with, um, with actually spreading kindness to others, to really make a positive difference for, for their relationship with their parents, their, their brothers, sisters, their family. And that way, we, we all create just greater energy of positivity. So at a basic level, it's, it's um, trust your goals, work to make them happen, work to support your family's well-being, and then to the degree possible, learn advocacy skills. How can, how can we make positive changes here for, for Ventura? Ventura County, Ventura City, you know, the school. You know, what needs attention? Who do I need to talk to? So learning how to develop that proactive orientation where you're always looking at, if we, if we want to create a better system here, who do we need to talk to? Who do we need to put pressure on? Who do we need to educate? And, and developing a plan to do that. So... Kind of in that same vein, I'm sure a lot of people at this point are wondering, how do you become an activist? Well, okay. Um, you do it in the doing. Um, and I think, like I said, a family activist is someone who says, you know what, my family is important to me, and I'm going to do what I can to create more love and well-being in my own family. And, and that's going to start with just my relationship with my brother. I'm going to have to kind of reach out to him. I don't know why he seems to be pissed off at me all the time, but I need to, I need to create resolution there. So you're now, you're actively putting energy into that. So now you're a little bit of an activist there. The activism is around creating greater family well-being. Um, but then you look around and you see that, hey, you know, a lot of, a lot of the kids in my neighborhood are are at risk of getting hit by cars because the cars zoom by here and there's no crosswalks. You know what, ideally there should be a crosswalk. So you start thinking, okay, how can I make that happen? You might call up the city and say, look, this is a problem in my street. Kids have nearly been hit by cars. How do you get a crosswalk? And then you start learning what needs, what can be done and what you need to make, do to make that happen. So the activism is like you see a need you see a potential, you see a possibility, and you say, you know what, I want to do something about this, and you start doing the doing to make a difference. And part of it is this learning, doing that initial research, and then, then follow through with the action. So a really big part of activism is just the empowerment that comes from it, and 
happens by it. So what is empowerment to you? Uh, beautiful questions. you got great questions. Okay. Well, if you look at the word empowerment, um, and it actually comes out of the 15th century. Back then, when the, the king would empower one of his subjects to go forth on behalf of the realm to do for the king. Or the pope would empower folks to go forth in behalf of the church to do. So it was hierarchical. Someone's giving someone power. I believe in the idea of co-powerment. Co-powerment is that I commit to interact with you in such a way where you connect more with your power and I also connect more with mine and we develop a relationship where there's more power. So co-powerment is about actively looking at how can we lift each other up to be our best. And again, the reality is in our society here, a lot of feel, people feel they don't have a, very much power. Power to re- achieve their own goals, power to make a you know, difference in, in the state, in the nation, and all that. Well, we don't to the degree we, we believe we don't have any. So it's important to kind of all of us to learn how can I be more co-powering with my communication so, so I'm lifting others up. And very much begin with parents. Parents sometimes don't realize how much power they have to nurture greater self-confidence and self-esteem in their children. And oftentimes it can begin by telling a daughter, look, you know what, I love the way you think. And just a number of children, if they would have heard that when they were young, they were, wow, I have great thinking abilities because I remember my dad and my mom said that. So we have that ability and we need to be just more... um, open to share those kind of, you know, comments, feedback with each other to, to lift each other up and, and engage in, in that co-powerment process. So you have said so many wonderful things during this interview, but what is the one thing you really want people to take away from this? Oh, it just, one is believe in your full potential to be all of who you are. You know, that's our purpose here on, on Mother Earth. We're we're all here in this, this round to actually learn how to become better people. So acknowledge that, own that, and, and begin working it as an adventure. As a venture, how can I become more my best? And, you know, of course, we also look at how can I survive and also be my best, but that's, that, that's part of it. So just trusting your, your brilliance, trusting your intelligence, and trusting our collective ability to, to create more good in the world. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's, it was honestly really inspiring. <laughs> I love I love hearing about like other people's point of views. I love I'm sure everybody else watching does too. So yeah, just thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity and um, you know, blessings for you and blessings for everyone listening. May everybody who listens think, you know what? Yes, I I can be more myself and I can make it happen. Thank you for watching. I'm Campton Carter with ECTV, and I hope you enjoyed the show.